So we're now going to talk about a different kind of bleeding as opposed to, um, you know, all over the floor. We're going to talk about hemophilia. Uh, so just, uh, uh, and I have uh, my longtime colleague, Mac Monroe, also is, a, I guess, an author on this, even though I'm delivering the talk, because he's the biochemist, and we're going to talk about uh, some biochemistry here. From, from blood on the floor to uh, biochemistry is a pretty big leap, but here we go. Since this isn't a hemophilia um, symposium, let me give you just a little bit of background. Um, uh, hemophilia A is what we're talking about here, and emicizumab is a novel therapy that's recently come on the market for hemophilia A. And of course, hemophilia A is a deficiency of factor VIII, uh, traditionally managed by infusions of purified factor VIII. Unfortunately, about 30% of the people uh, with hemophilia A develop an immune response to factor VIII. They produce antibodies that block factor VIII function or clear it from circulation. And then replacement therapy doesn't work very well. Uh, and those folks have to get uh, a bypassing agent, uh, and by that we mean something that bypasses the need for factor VIII, either recombinant 7A or um, FIBA, which is a partially activated prothrombin complex concentrate. And these folks with inhibitors have worse outcomes than patients without an inhibitor. Fortunately, uh, some really novel therapies have come onto the market for hemophilia in recent years. And the one we're going to talk about in this short presentation is emicizumab. This is a bispecific antibody um, that they say similar to factor VIII, and I'm gonna make an argument that it's only similar and not quite the same. It binds to factor uh, 9 or 9A and 10 or 10A and uh, facilitates 9A activation of 10. This is an effective therapy in hemophilia A in patients either with or without inhibitors. There are other novel therapies on the horizon and these uh, include, <clears throat> excuse me, inhibiting the plasma protease inhibitors that would uh, enhance hemostasis in people who aren't making thrombin very well because they have hemophilia, and these would work in either hemophilia A or B. But emicizumab has been a game changer. It's the one of these that's now on the market. Uh, it only requires, first of all, subcutaneous dosing, not IV access, and it can be dosed every week or every two weeks, or in sometimes in some patients at even longer intervals. And it works in people with or without inhibitors. So this has had a big impact on the quality of life for people with hemophilia. One of the problems is that with all of these novel agents, there have been some thrombotic events during the clinical trials. Um, all of them have had, uh, I guess what I would call garden variety thrombotic events. And often these uh, occur in patients who have existing risk factors for thrombosis. So vascular disease, some older people, um, some other causes for hypercoagulability. And that sort of thing has been seen with factor replacement and with bypassing agents. But emicizumab has also had the, this novel complication, and that is a thrombotic microangiopathy. While there have only been a small number of cases, um, this is, is novel because it has not been seen uh, with it has not been seen with other um, replacement therapies or bypassing therapies. So thrombotic microangiopathy is a pathology that results in thrombosis in the smallest vessels and the capillaries and arterioles. And there are other microangiopathies like TTP. Uh, and uh, it's associated with endothelial injury. And it causes organ dysfunction uh, because of the occlusion of these small vessels. So just to reiterate, thrombotic microangiopathy has never, to my knowledge, been reported as a consequence of replacement or bypassing therapy in hemophilia. So this is a unique uh, complication that's been seen with emicizumab uh, and specifically in patients who were bleeding and were treated for that bleeding with repeated high doses of fiber. Uh, 
this uh, partially activated prothrombin complex concentrate. Uh, people who were bleeding on emicizumab and received recombinant factor 7a did not experience this complication. So we got interested in trying to understand what causes this unique thrombotic microangiopathy. So let's talk about what factor 8 does and how it does it and how emicizumab might be different from that. So factor 8 is the one grayed out here. It's what's deficient in hemophilia A. It is the cofactor for the protease factor 9A. And to, together they activate normally, activate factor 10 to 10A, which is then responsible in combination with its cofactor 5A for producing enough thrombin to form a stable fibrin clot. Now I showed you first what it looks like in the coagulation cascade model. But in, in real life, these reactions occur on the activated platelet surface. Here's 8A uh, with its protease 9A on the platelet surface. And the 9A is provided either by the action of 7A tissue factor on a, another cell type or by the action of 11A on the platelet surface. So here's a schematic of what factor 8 does. It binds quite tightly to phospholipid membranes, and it coordinates the assembly of 9A and 10 uh, into a complex and facilitates the rapid activation of factor 10 uh, by 9A. And here's a cartoon from this review of what the bispecific antibody emicizumab does. It has one site that will bind to either 9 or 9A, and another site that will bind uh, to factor 10 or 10A. And it's shown here on a phospholipid membrane, but of course the antibody doesn't have any specific uh, ability to bind to phospholipid. And it's shown here bringing together 9A and 10, but in fact, I'd like to show you some evidence that that's probably not quite the way it really works. So could biochemical differences between factor eight and emicizumab give us some clues as to what causes or how this microangiopathy might develop? We're not the first people to have thought about this question. Um, Peter Lenting and his colleagues published a review a few years back and that uh, this graphic is from that review. And I just want to highlight a couple of differences between factor eight and emicizumab. So factor eight has what they call full cofactor activity. That is, it binds to phospholipids quite tightly uh, and it interacts um, in multiple ways with factor 9A and factor 10 and really does coordinate assembly of that complex. It's running the show. It also has an on-off mechanism. Factor eight needs to be activated by thrombin that's formed at a site of injury. <clears throat> and unless it's activated and released from von Willebrand's factor, it's not active. Uh, and once it's activated, uh, the, uh, the domains tend to dissociate, and so it loses activity over time. So it, its activity is limited in time and space. Emicizumab, as I pointed out, um, does not bind phospholipid. It binds between the two factors. Uh, the protease 9A and the substrate factor 10, and it has no on-off mechanism. It has a long circulating half-life and it's active the whole time. Uh, once it's bound um, 9A and 10, it doesn't lose activity. It retains activity and can go on and continue to catalyze reactions. So its regulation is very different, both in terms of its location and duration of action. There are some, I would say, mysteries about how emicizumab works. Um, these are the, uh, the affinities of emicizumab for it, uh, what it binds to. The one arm of emicizumab binds to factor 9 or 9A with micromolar affinity, and the other arm binds to 10 or 10A also with micromolar affinity. That's not very tight binding. But when you get um, 9A, 10, and phospholipid together with emicizumab, then you have a much higher affinity interaction. But it's kind of hard to imagine how these kinds of affinities 
would result in effective catalysis because that's that's not very strong binding. So we started out by um, taking a look at several biochemical parameters of emicizumab. It's taken me so long to be able to say that at all. I love just rattling it off. <laughs> it doesn't always work. Um, and its interaction with factor 9A and 10. So you can see here that um, at three different concentrations of emicizumab, titrating in factor 9A in the presence of factor 10, so these are the ingredients in this reaction, uh, enhances activation of factor 10, which is what this rate is. And the affinity for factor 9A is nanomolar in our hands as well, low nanomolar. Um, the affinity factor for factor 10, when you have all those components together, is also nanomolar. It's not quite, we don't have it being quite as tight as some of the published literature. But again, you titrate in factor 10 in the presence of 9A phospholipid and emicizumab, and the rate of factor 10 activation is used as a measure of binding, and that's pretty tight affinity. So um, we agree that functionally, the emicizumab uh, interaction with its binding partners is, uh, ends up being pretty tight. Now, one of the um, expectations one would have uh, since, fact, since emicizumab binds to both factor 9 and 9A is that in the plasma, in vivo, factor 9 should compete for 9A binding and kind of limit the activity of emicizumab. And so we took a look at that um, here is the relative rate of factor 10 activation on phospholipid in the presence of emicizumab as you titrate in factor 9A when there's no factor 9 around. And you can see here, again, a, a low nanomolar affinity. If you add factor 9, you kind of expect factor 9 to compete with the 9A, but in fact it doesn't. Um, this is just below um, plasma levels of factor 9. And even if you go up to 800 nanomolar factor 9, you see minimal, minimal <clears throat> competition uh, for 9A binding. So that was something of a surprise that we needed to explain. The um, other um, component of this interaction is the phospholipid. And we used phospholipid vesicles that contain phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylcholine. And as you titrate the lipid component in, in the, um, with just factor 9A and factor 10, you can see that the lipid does enhance 9A uh, activation of 10 to 10A all by itself. And a, and a peak level is obtained uh, a little over 100 micromolar. The reason this activity goes down above that is because then the 9A and 10 can tend to get sequestered to different phospholipid vesicles and that actually reduces the rate of activation. So this is factor 9A and 10 uh, driving the phospholipid localization of the reaction. If you add factor 8, factor 8 binds phospholipid much more tightly and it drives localization of the reaction to phospholipid surfaces in our biochemical experiment. And it drives, uh, part. this is part of the mechanism by which it drives localization to platelets in vivo. So factor eight binds very tightly and brings uh, the 9A and 10 together on that phospholipid surface efficiently. If instead of factor eight, you add emicizumab, you can see that it's the 9A and 10 binding uh, that drives uh, localization to the phospholipid surface. And the emicizumab doesn't change that affinity. It, it does enhance the rate, um, but we're plotting this as the maximal rate being equal to one. And, and that occurs at the same phospholipid concentration. So these data suggested to us the following hypothesis. We know that 9A and 10 bind to phospholipid on their own, and that complex can result in activation of factor 10A, but it's not very efficient. And we hypothesize that emicizumab binds to the preformed complex of 9A, 10, and phospholipid, and stabilizes that complex long enough for catalysis to occur 
and for factor 10a to be activated much more efficiently. This also might explain uh, another mystery, and that is why would the complex of emicizumab with 9a and 10 or 10a come apart? Because the affinity of emicizumab for 10 and 10a is the same. Uh, well, in fact, 10A and 9A don't like to bind to one another. So this complex comes apart because the 10A and the 9A don't like being together. Now, factor eight is localized to platelets, uh, not only because it's of its phospholipid binding, but also because it's carried by von Willebrand factor, which binds to glycoprotein 1B, which is this little green thingy in the cartoon here. And, it's, and factor eight is activated by thrombin, which is the little red doodad in this cartoon. Uh, and that leaves fact, activated factor eight on the platelet surface where it binds tightly to activated platelets. So where would emicizumab localize? Well, I couldn't find any published data on this. Um, maybe someone in our, our audience knows more than I could find, but ideally it would bind to activated platelets. And that's probably what happens under normal conditions because it likely goes to the surfaces where its binding partners, 9A and 10, are localized. So this might be platelets, all right, but it could also be other membranes. And I don't have time to discuss the, the uh, published data in this regard, but long ago it was shown that factor 9A can bind to endothelial cells and retains activity. Factor 10 and 10A um, can bind to endothelial cells, and the 10A can assemble with 5A into a prothrombinase complex on endothelial cells. And this was done in vivo in, in mouse models of vascular injury. So could incorrect localization have something to do with the issue of, of fiber uh, and um, microangiopathy in patients getting emicizumab? So what's in FIBA? FIBA contains the zymogen of vitamin K dependent factors, procoagulants uh, in significant amounts. It also contains smaller amounts of activated factors, including 9A. And, and we don't know exactly uh, how much is in there because that's not something that's normally um, QC'd in preparation of this product. But, however, we have shown uh, Ammon Fager um, working with me, uh, he's a hematologist at Duke University, um, showed that factor 9A can activate factor 10 on cultured endothelial cells in the presence of emicizumab, and this shows increasing concentrations of 9A. And these are endothelial cells treated with tumor necrosis factor, so they're uh, in an inflammatory condition. And Patrick Ellsworth, working in Nigel Key's lab at the University of North Carolina, showed something similar in a flow model. He cultured endothelial cells in, uh, in under flow, which makes them happier, so that the healthy endothelium is healthier and more like the in vivo cells. And again, the activated endothelium was treated with, t uh, with tumor necrosis factor. And you can see that under these conditions, um, emicizumab can facilitate 9A activation of 10 to 10A and does it more efficiently on activated endothelium than healthy endothelium. So I would put forward for your consideration the hypothesis that injured or activated microvascular endothelium could provide sites um, for binding of factor 9A from FIBA and 10A from plasma as well as provided by FIBA and that that could localize emicizumab to damaged endothelial surfaces and produce 10A on those surfaces that could in turn uh, bind 5A and lead to local thrombin generation. And that thrombin generation on activated or injured endothelial cells might be responsible for the observed microangiopathy in patients treated simultaneously with emicizumab and high doses of 5A. Thank you for your attention. I almost made my time. <laughs> Thanks, Maureen. Very thought-provoking. Um, I see Dr. Prysdale with a microphone in his hand. All right. Hi, Maureen. 
Hi, Maureen. Thanks a lot for that really provocative talk. And nice to see you. Nice to see you. I wish I were there. I wish you were, too. <laughs> We'd have a nice dinner together. Um, yes, we could. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering about some papers that I think I remember, maybe by uh, Jan Rosing, maybe by Peter Lenting, about production of some monoclonal antibodies against factor IX and how that enhanced the catalytic activity directly of factor 9A, and how maybe EMI is directly enhancing the catalytic activity of factor 9A, rather than merely bringing together enzyme and substrate, and how that might fit into your model. Yeah, so um, we, we did uh, do some limited number of studies um, looking for that, and just adding um, uh, the uh, emicizumab doesn't really seem to, so one way of looking for that is to look at, at 9A cleavage of substrate, and um, uh, that is a, a um, chromogenic substrate. It doesn't seem, the antibody doesn't seem to affect that directly. Um, the, it, it could still look, uh, it could still um, affect uh, interaction with 10, even though it doesn't with a chromogenic substrate. And so th that's, um, that is the only thing that we have directly looked at ourselves that would, would address that question. And we don't, don't see any evidence for enhanced catalytic activity of 9A. So, so you that's about all I can yeah you would have had to ha get can you, you would have had to have your get your hands on some monofunctional antibody then that didn't recognize the that didn't, yeah. mm -hmm. yes e exciting great mm -hmm. other questions from the audience dr conway hey, nice to see you that was fabulous nice to see you so why don't you see this more often? Um, I think, well, first of all, there are not that many people that get repeated high doses of FIBA. I think you have to get enough circulating 9A um, to, to initiate a real pathogenic process on the endothelium. And I think you probably have to have endothelial injury or inflammation. Um, and and so it's the people that exhibited this microangiopathy did get really quite high doses, repeated doses of fiber. Now, um, uh, I, you know, some of my colleagues <laughs> in in times past looked at the survival of nine A um, in plasma or in mice, um, and it seems as though ni well, 9A is not that rapidly inhibited by antithrombin um, in the absence of heparin. Um, it might be cleared uh, on uh, the scavenger receptor, but at least in the mouse model, when Sal Pizzo's group looked at it, the 9A did survive in the circulation for uh, a couple of hours at least. So I think you have to accumulate enough 9A and that's pr to get um, uh, 10A generation started on injured endothelium and that's probably not easy to do. Well, that's all good news. <laughs> yes, I, well and so some people have said, well, why are you even interested in this? We figured out how to avoid it. We just don't give people a whole bunch of Fiber, but I think it tells us something about uh, the localization of the coagulation reactions and um, and the I guess you would say the resilience of the hemostatic system and our and our control mechanisms for hemostasis. Great, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Maureen. That was great. Well, thank you for the.